in the grocery store, we really only have to think about six. And that's um, just real quick. Corn, canola, cottonseed, soy, sunflower, safflower. In the United States, we have canola. Overseas, there's instead of canola, rapeseed. But memorize those six. And if you can turn the package around and scan for those six ingredients, then you can turn your health around. Well, this is going to be fun uh, because I was very impressed with your first book, and I'm just delighted that you've come out with a new one. I had the opportunity to read it, and we're going to have a great discussion. So you've highlighted a fascinating point in your book that vegetable oils, unlike anything our ancestors ever consumed, require extensive processing to be even considered edible. And I want you to take people through this because it seems very obvious that, well, gosh, um, soybean oil, don't you just have to press on a soybean and out comes the oil and there you go. So it's a lot more complicated than that, right? It's quite a (laughs) bit more complicated than that. It's unimaginably complicated. People have to get degrees and, you know, from technical schools with huge backgrounds in biochemistry to be able to do it so that the oils don't come out being absolutely inedible and just smelling bad and outright toxic. There's many factories involved, not just steps in a factory, but there's many factories. And even just the first one, to get the oil out, they use intense heat, 600 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than, you know, a pizza oven, which is a really hot oven if you've ever made pizza, uh, and intense pressure. And the vast majority, they also need to use solvents like hexane gas, which is toxic too, to get the oil out. And that crude oil that they extract truly is crude and rude. It is stinky. It is vile smelling. It looks, it's black, blackish brown and thick and sludgy. And if you eat it, it would, you, you know, you, you would probably throw up. It's that immediately instantaneously toxic. Now I'm going to stop you right there uh, because I want everybody to know that you're not just saying this as a whim or as an MD. You trained as a biochemist. So you know of which you speak in these processes, correct? Yes. I went to Cornell before I went to medical school right. to get a degree in biochemistry. And that's actually the reason that when I started learning about what I was really eating back more than 20 years ago now, these oils caught my eye because when I looked up what their chemistry was, I recognized a fingerprint signature that signaled these things could be dangerous. And that's double bonds. And and I do talk about that in chapter one of the book with pictures. You really need pictures to visualize some of this, I think. So it's, uh, it can, you know, it can be technical to understand it, but I go into those technicals so people can see that it's real. It's truly, we're generating toxins here in these factories. Yeah, and I, I like that you actually do use pictures and visuals throughout the book because a lot of this is fairly technical and just seeing it visually, uh, good for you for doing that. Yeah, you know, it's uh, we're actually fighting a different visual here. I'm fighting this battle uh, to get people to understand how toxic these oils are and how they just destroy everyone's metabolism. Everyone is eating them. Um, but I'm fighting against another vision. And, and you probably have heard about this and talked about it maybe because the idea of saturated fat being health, healthy or unhealthy, I mean, rests on a visual too. It was originally like put out there as these saturated fats turn solid, just like butter turns solid in your fridge. So it'll solidify in your arteries and clog them up like grease in a pipe. And that visual is so powerful that even though it was created in the 1950s and 60s, it's still in our mind's eye these days that saturated fat literally clogs up like a pipe. It's not true. never was true. It's overly simplistic. It has nothing to do with chemistry. It's just 
a dangerous visual. So I want to replace that with real visuals in the book. And I, I mentioned a replacement visual too. Like in addition to providing those chemical pictures so you can see how toxins are forming, the thinking that we can have is these oils corrode our arteries, like dumping some sort of toxin into your arteries, right? And it will weaken them and they will, they will bleed and clot. And that's more, it's a more true valid image because we treat heart attacks with clot busters, don't we? Yep. We don't treat it with fat dissolvers. If it really truly were just fat, then we would put some sort of enzyme or something in there to dissolve that fat building up. But that's that's not what we do at all. You know, uh, I think one of the nice things about uh, the book is kind of explaining where all of this idea of vegetable oils came from. And just take us through the industrial byproduct of cotton seeds, which were useless after taking them out of cotton and take us through how in the world we got from a, you know, a byproduct of making cotton to idea that uh, Crisco was really good for you. Yeah, it was chemistry. It came from chemists. Uh, the brothers Proctor and Gamble were chemists who founded a, a soap and candle wax company and this was way back in the 19th century, in the, like in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. And they saw, they were looking into the future of their business, which was, you know, mostly candles. And they saw electricity and electric lights as a huge threat. So they wanted to diversify and divest. And they were already using this byproduct of the textile industry, I mean, the cottonseed oil. They were already using that to make candles and candle wax. So they wanted to find a different use for it. And what they did was hire a different chemist to tinker with it some more so that it would remove one of the toxic agents that grows in the plant that the plant uses. Like the plant cotton seed protects its little seeds from being eaten by birds by putting in a toxin called gossipol. Um, that makes, you know, that makes it immediately toxic to, to people, cows. That's why they couldn't use it as animal feed. The chemist had to remove that toxin. And then it was kind of like a sludgy, somewhat thick liquid. And they're like, huh, if we, it kind of looks like lard a little bit. Let's tinker with the recipe a little more. And poof, they invented Crisco shortening, the first, but one of the first vegetable shortenings. And it was truly a byproduct of the, the a byproduct of a byproduct, basically, because it was no longer even useful for candles anymore. That was a third rate kind of level of use, selling it to people who couldn't afford the real thing. And in advertising, you speak a great deal about using, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on his name, a, a, a great advertising genius of the mid 1900s who uh, really knew how to sell things that people really didn't need or didn't want. And <laughs> yeah, this man was Ed Bernays. There you go. And he's considered the father of modern advertising because unlike previous advertising psychology, which just like spelled out, oh, this is a better product. It's more durable. It was like all based on logic. He knew how to pull people's heartstrings and uh, pull our levers and make us afraid or make us, uh, you know, want to look cool with different products. And so one of his first campaigns was actually to help sell cigarettes to women. So this just kind of gives you an idea of the kinds of industries he was working with. Right. And, and he did that um, in a way that still like, is being used today. It was kind of like the precursor for Vir Virginia Slims. Like yeah. The, yeah. the woman who is um, independent and can you know, bring home the bacon and fry it up in a pan kind of thing. He called, he called uh, cigarettes torches of freedom. And what it did was it elevated women who smoke from being seen as trashy 
to being seen as liberated and independent and free thinkers. So it was, it was incredibly successful and, and like that really helped sell cigarettes really quick. It was, uh, it was it, like the sales of quadrupled uh, in just a few years after, after Ed Bernays. So he knew how to help Procter and Gamble and he had kind of a devilish strategy if, uh, if you want to, should I go into that now? Sure. Yeah, let's do, let's go right there. So his strategy, he knew that people would, all, everybody, every doctor had, had like a different thought on what was healthy and what was not healthy. And, you know, doctors had their own ideas. So he knew that he, if he dangled the dollar bill in front of a bunch of doctors, that somebody would show up to grab it and that that would benefit his client Procter and Gamble because that's just how it works like he he knew psychology he knows that if a man's salary depends on him believing in something well gosh darn it it's going to be impossible next to impossible to get him to not believe in it so the person who stepped up well the organization who um who he donated the money to is an organization that you, I'm sure, as a cardiologist, are very familiar with, the American Heart Association. And that's how they got started. They got $1.7 million from Procter & Gamble. And shortly after that, they started funding research that showed, that, or that would show, that vegetable oils lower cholesterol, and therefore that meant that they were heart healthy. And guess what? None of those two statements are true. They do lower cholesterol, but That's that true. doesn't mean they're heart healthy, right? Correct. That's the disconnect. That's the disconnect that uh, doctors of the day, like they re tried to regale against it. They, tr they tried to say, look, this isn't true. We don't have any evidence of this, but all of those folks are no longer with us. And the lie that was created back in the 1940s by the American Heart Association has gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. And the American Heart Association is now the dominant source of nutrition thought in the entire world. And they're still telling us this lie 70 years later. And we're still getting sick and dying from the idea that cholesterol clogs arteries and vegetable oils are healthy because they can lower cholesterol. Yeah, the and you spend actually quite a bit of time in the book talking about Ansel Keys, who is legendary in so many ways in nutrition. And Ansel Keys, for those of you who haven't followed you or me, was a, a Minnesota uh, trained nutritionist who actually designed the K ration in World War II that fed our troops. And that's where the word K came from, K ration. And when Dwight Eisenhower had his heart, heart attack in the mid 50s, they couldn't figure out how this vigorous, general, healthy, you know, how in the world did Dwight Eisenhower have a heart attack? So who would they bring in to advise them but Ansel Keys? And Ansel Keys, as you and I know, had a very interesting agenda that uh, he was absolutely convinced that saturated fat was the cause of heart disease. And you go into the whole story of how he had 21 countries that he studied right after World War II, looking at the association of saturated fat in the diet and heart disease, but chose to only choose six or seven of those countries to finally make his case because the other countries didn't fit his model. And uh, in my last couple books, I've gone into how, in fact, he excluded France from his model, even though he had countries on either side, like Italy or uh, England, in his model. And why in the world would he exclude them? Well, because the huge saturated fat eating in, in France. But we digress. He, uh, he was a great salesman. And 
He, uh, he sold on the McGovern Commission on this. Uh, he sold the American Heart Association. But I want to, since you brought up the American Heart Association, we were talking off camera. I was a president of the American Heart Association Desert Southern California chapter for two years. And I learned firsthand where the heart healthy symbol came from and how it was acquired. And uh, people, I don't think, know, and you do bring it up, uh, that this, the American Heart Association endorses things not based on research, but basically on how much money they're paid. One of my favorite, since um, the desert in Southern California grows large amounts of citrus and grapefruit, as does Arizona, and you're in Florida, and you know that you grow a lot of citrus in Florida. And isn't it surprising that the American Heart Association Heart Healthy Seal is on Florida grapefruit, but it's not on California or Arizona grapefruit. You know why? Because the Florida Grapefruit Commission paid the American Heart Association $400,000 for that seal. When the Get With the Guidelines campaign came out to get people to basically lower their cholesterol with the use of statin drugs, the educational program was actually sponsored not by the American Heart Association, but it was sponsored by one of the statin companies through a generous grant to the American Heart Association to get with the guidelines. Well, that is some great insider information. And, you know, I've been dying to ask you how it's, it was as a cardiologist working with your peers. Like, I, I think it's um, a rare person who is able to like think outside the box to question what we learn to see these connections these larger connections um that are like running things like what's really going on behind the scenes and as a doctor myself when i kind of went through the rabbit hole or through the looking alice in wonderland's <laughs> looking glass and came out on the other side and realized i'd been i was living in the backward backwards world my colleagues were still back there and I tried to reach in and pull them out. Like, oh, cholesterol was never, was framed basically for uh, heart attacks, never really found guilty, just framed for crimes committed originally by cigarette smoking. And uh, right, was at, back in the 1950s yeah. and 60s, the number one, people were smoking like chimneys. Why did Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, have a heart attack when he was so healthy? Well, he was a four-pack-per-day smoker. And at the same time that Ansel Keys was pushing his anti-saturated fat agenda, he was covering up the reality that there was so much data at that time already that cigarette smoking was causing heart attacks. And the American Heart Association said nothing about that relationship. They said nothing against cigarettes for decades. They didn't say anything until after the Surgeon General's warning. And after a decade after that, they finally said, they finally got behind the campaign to stop cigarette smoking on airplanes. And why, why does it matter? <clears throat> well, because cigarette smoking causes heart attacks, not because it raises cholesterol. If you're a one pack per day smoker, you don't have higher cholesterol than a zero pack per day smoker. If you're a four pack per day smoker, you don't have even higher cholesterol. So it, it causes heart attacks by a completely different mechanism that has to do with exactly what vegetable oils do to our arteries, which is promote oxidation, oxidative stress. That is the chemical cause of arteriosclerosis, of metabolic disease. It even drives obesity. It's the cause of cellular death. It's the cause of death at the cellular level, this concept called oxidative stress. And it's it sounds abstract, but it's just a, a term that really helps you understand how your body manages and controls energy. And the key that I want people to come away with is that 
life and health depend on our metabolism's ability to generate energy. Because, you know, how do you feel when you wake up and you had a good night's sleep and you're full of energy? You, feel, you know, versus you had no sleep or you know you kind of overdid it with something in your diet and you thought you wake up feeling tired and inflamed. That has to do with energy. And vegetable oils, they promote this deadly condition called oxidative stress. And the chemistry has to do with free radicals that affect our cells very much the way radiation does. So it's directly damaging and immensely difficult for our cells to survive under this onslaught of oxidative stress. And basically oxidative stress, I mean, basically vegetable oils are oxidative stress in a bottle, which is to say, they're accelerated aging in a bottle because oxidative stress is the thing that ages us and kills us. And that is the root cause of all these mysterious diseases people are now suffering from that when they go to their doctor, their doctor can't really get to the root cause. They'll say, oh, you know, you're overweight. Well, that's because of genetics or you're you know, too lazy or you know, maybe uh, you just need better willpower so that you don't eat so much sugar. But the key to understanding how oxidative stress is making you feel physically different on a daily basis has to do with hunger. And I talk about that in chapter four of Dark Calories, which I think is maybe one of the most important chapters in there because, you know, how many people today Dr. Gundry, do you hear talking about how they feel hand, hangry compared to, you know, just 20, 30, 40 years ago? I know when I was a kid, it wasn't even a thing. No. Right. So hangry is a new phenomenon. And hangry is really the same kind of, uh, hangry is a sign that your brain isn't getting energy. When it, it, it feels actually like our blood sugar is dropping. And so we, we instinctively reach for food. We reach for snacks. And if we keep doing that, we're going to gain weight. So that's how oxidative stress is actually the root cause of weight gain and the entire obesity and metabolic disease epidemic. That is the biggest problem we are facing today. So let me, um, people... I was recently on a podcast with a with a cardiologist who was adamant that um, PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, are number one essential for the construction of membranes and mitochondrial membranes. And I think both you and I would agree that they are. Yes. Okay, but that they are essential in our dietary control of cholesterol and that, you know, to be adamant that these things, because they are essential in small amounts for the functioning of our mitochondria and our cell membranes, that to villainize them is really a, a horrible thing. And, you know, how dare you tell people that you know, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which do lower cholesterol, that are called essential because they are essential. How can you take these away from us? Everyone knows, the American Heart Association knows how important these things are. What say you? Well, I would say that person is lying because <laughs> I'm not taking away polyunsaturated fatty acids. I'm taking away vegetable oils that are industrial products that are insanely and unnaturally produced and so high in polyunsaturated fatty acids that they cannot be properly stabilized for use in heating and cooking applications by all the king's horses and all the king's men who have tried to do so for the past hundreds of years. I'm talking about the chemists who I cite in the first chapter of Dark Calories as warning us that when we fry with these things for you know high heat pan frying at home in our kitchen to make something like uh, fried chicken to give it that Wessonality. I don't know if you remember those commercials. Uh, yep. you know, make your fried chicken and polyunsaturated corn oil. When we do that at home or when restaurants do that, uh, then 
like if a restaurant does it, a single fry has as much toxic chemical called uh, aldehydes, alpha beta unsaturated aldehydes, known to cause cancer, known to harm energy generating mitochondria, known to be directly toxic to the nervous system. Chemists have been warning that these oils contain these toxins. And so I would say to someone who says that not only are, you know, to argue against me saying you can't take away polyunsaturated fatty acids, I am certainly not doing that. And don't, don't try to put words in my mouth, <laughs> right? That is a lie. I never said that. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, we were, as a human species, we got plenty of them before vegetable oils were ever invented. So we don't need to rely on these unnatural toxic, but toxin rich products that, well, that you know, they're toxic when they leave the factory and they're even more toxic after we cook with them. And we don't need to rely on them. And in fact, in toxicology, there's a saying, the dose makes the poison. Anything in too high of a quantity can be toxic directly, even without the formation of these toxins during heating and cooking. So the medical industry right now is completely ignoring that fact, those realities, those are hard, cold realities. The people that within the industry, the vegetable oil industry, the people who work for companies like Unilever and Monsanto that sell these oils, they're the ones saying that they're the ones where, who taught me that these oils contain toxins. And so the, it's disgusting to me that the American Heart Association and the doctors like the ones you were talking to are less interested in the truth about these oils than the food industry whose entire financial empires depend on selling more of these oils. Because that's the world we live in right now, where we're hearing more truth from the people selling the oils than the supposed healers out there, like those at the American Heart Association. And, you know, those are kind of like the priests. The American Heart Association is like the Pope. <laughs> Um, of this religion that cholesterol clogs our arteries. And guys that are like Dariush Mozafarian, maybe you know him, guys that run um, the deans of the nutrition schools at Harvard and Tufts, and I'm sure you've run into these characters, they're like the bishops. And then, you know, then doctors who haven't gone through the rabbit hole, we are the, unfortunately the priests, and we are selling this false religion to people that cholesterol oil that cholesterol is clogging our arteries and we need these cholesterol lowering oils it's a religion and it's a bad religion it's a dangerous religion it is not a science that's my point that nutrition science is a religion it is no longer a science all right i want to jump ahead you made a good case and you make a very good case in the book Thank you. But you've designed a two-week jumpstart plan because you spend a lot of time saying this stuff is in you and it's hard to get out of you and it's a process, uh, as you and I both know. How do we jumpstart all this? Take us through it. Uh, give somebody hope that this is reversible. Yes, it's, it is totally reversible. In fact, there is no sort of metabolic damage that can't be fixed with better diet. True. It comes down to getting more energy for your cells. And that comes down to recovering from the oxidative damage and preparing your body to deal with oxidative stress. So in the two-week challenge, I teach you the foods that are going to not only like substitute for vegetable oils, the healthy fats, but also the vitamins you need, the minerals you need, the other nutrients that you need, the high protein foods, the right kind of carbohydrate containing foods, because, you know, not all carbohydrate containing foods are bad for us. It's really just the processed, highly refined stuff. So I teach you all of that because that, the, the you can actually build a, a meal that gives you energy versus another meal, it's based on our choice, that steals our energy. So that's what the two-week challenge does in the entire last part of the book, which is four chapters, full, chock full of information that helps you understand how to maximize your body's energy and turn around whatever metabolic disease you might be suffering from with a healthy, balanced diet. And it all begins, of course, with a simple habit of just picking up every single thing that you buy 
and turning that package around to scan for one of the, I call them the, the sinister six that are going to be in ingredients. There's actually eight altogether, so I call it those, the hateful eight. But but in the grocery store, we really only have to think about six, and that's um, just real quick. Corn, canola, cottonseed, soy, sunflower, safflower. In the United States, we have canola. Overseas, there's instead of canola, rapeseed. But memorize those six, and if you can turn the package around and scan for those six ingredients, then you can turn your health around and get more energy. Starting on day one, that's my goal for you, is to feel physically better. That's how you know it's working. You don't have to go to the doctor and get any tests done. I mean, you can, but that's another issue because they're going to tell you high cholesterol is a problem. That's going to lead to arguments. So you have to, it's really important. We do have to learn how to recognize when we are healing ourselves. And it's very simple because I do teach you how to track your energy improvements in the book too. And that's the key. Instead of focusing on weight, that is another one of the lies that metabolic health comes down to our body fat, you know, our body composition, having too much fat. It comes down to our ability to generate energy and avoid inflammation. And that's what this book is all about helping you do. I also noticed uh, you, uh, like myself, come down on protein powders. Good for you. I feel like I'm, you know, crying out in the wilderness that... Uh, the protein powders talk about man-made these things also didn't exist up until a few years ago that's so true i'm so glad you noticed that you are the first person to notice that and i'm so glad to hear that you uh, that we are no longer the lone voice in the wilderness you know thinking of that we have uh, we're like the wonder twins of protein powders don't eat them right they do also promote oxidative stress yeah they're yeah they do yeah but that's another subject. All right. Well, congratulations on this book. Uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a good read. I wanna I want to do make a mention that you know you're talking in general about seed oils, but I want to make a pitch that you're not against all seed oils. Um, for instance, flax seeds, flaxseed oil is incredibly good for you if you use it right. You come quite positive on sesame oil, which I was intrigued to see. I want to tell you about perilla oil, which is mostly alpha linolenic acid. It's almost pure alpha linolenic acid, which is my darling of the vegetable oils. And I'm a huge fan of it. I use it in my patients to stop them having lipopolysaccharides in their blood, which I measure. And anyhow, so good for you. Not all seed oils are the evil empire. Right. Just the hateful eight. <laughs> <laughs> we always do an audience question and we've got a good one so if you don't mind i'll let you take a shot and then i'll take a shot peter darling 1965 writes dr gendry how can one find out if the oil is oxidized or not are there any brands that third party certify non-oxidations i have read that pufas and mufas that's monounsaturated fatty acids that's like olive oil, oxidize very quickly and most likely become rancid by the time the oil is in the supermarket. What are your thoughts regarding this? Your feedback would be very helpful indeed. All right. What say you? Anything you're going to buy in the grocery store that's made out of a, one of the hateful eight vegetable seed oils is going to be oxidized because uh, the while they could, in theory, like take a soy oil and manufacture it in such a way that it does not oxidize, that is going to cost probably a thousand times more. So it just is cost prohibitive. And therefore, it's not going to be in the grocery store unless, you know, you're, we're talking about a supplement. And if you're going to buy a supplement, you're not going to cook with it. And yes, the supplements should say something about what they do to mitigate oxidation. And if they are doing that, they will say so. But Stuff you're going to find in the restaurants doesn't matter. Like a lot of folks feel like if they're shopping at Whole Foods, right, or a more ex sitting down in a very expensive restaurant, they must be using a better quality oil. But the fact is that the Hateful Eight oil simply cannot be produced at scale in a way that makes them safe. But think about it with just like even olive oil. Olive oil is much 
more stable. It doesn't have so much polyunsaturated fatty acid. It's got, you know, healthy saturated and monounsaturated fat. And even that has grades and only the most expensive olive oil is the best. And it's the least oxidized, right? There's the lower grade olive oils that are more oxidized. And, you know, even olive oil, once you open the top, it begins to oxidize. Once you, you know, enter, put air in there. I always tell people, look, buy olive oil in dark bottles, buy it in small bottles and use it up quickly. More amazing episodes just like this one. Watch now. You got to be careful with MCT oil. If you start too quickly, many women get feelings of nausea, get loose bowel movements, even diarrhea. So work your way up. 